But this is a familiar passage in chapter 6. He says, put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers. Arche, the rulers. Against the powers against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything, to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. With all prayer and petition, praying at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known the manifold with boldness the mysteries of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Well, that's just a, a bit of an introduction into what we're going to be talking about tonight because we're back on this subject of these forces that we are involved with, that we are at war with, and that would be the demonic forces, those that have uh, some influence, a measure of influence over Christians and with non-Christians, even to the point of full possession. Now, I, would, I want to put some uh, things up here on the overhead for us to kind of, kind of go by tonight. Let me use it with this. Now, let's just think for a minute about the struggle that we're in. Uh, when we talk about the struggle that we are in, let's realize that, that we are dealing with uh, uh, several different things, of course. We've got our old sinful human nature, and, and that, that's, that's a big problem for us to begin with. When we're born into this world, we're born with a nature that's inclined towards sin. We're born with a sin nature. Jesus was not born with a sin nature. He was, uh, that's, uh, as a matter of fact, that's why it was so important that we hold the doctrine of, the true doctrine of the virgin birth. He didn't receive the sin nature that we received through our fathers because his father was the Holy Spirit. So he did not have, he had a human nature, but he did not have a sinful nature like we do. So this causes us a great deal of problem even after we're saved. That sin nature is rendered inoperative, but it's sort of like the illustration of, uh, well, let's just take this, uh, this overhead projector. Now, right now it's running, it's operating, but if I went over and I pulled the plug on it, it wouldn't be able to operate. It's inoperative. But what have I got to do to get it going again? Just plug her back in. That's right, it's ready to go. So that's the way it is with our sin nature. Even though we're saved, born again, uh, filled with the Spirit, we still have a human nature that we're, sinful human nature that we're dealing with. And uh, that doesn't require any demonic activity in order to lead us into sin. Remember, we have three enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. The flesh is what we're talking about, that old sin nature. When Paul speaks about his old nature or about the old man, he's speaking about that sinful nature that he was born with and he still struggles with. You find that in Romans chapter 7, of course. So here's the old flesh, the old man that uh, we struggle with. And then, uh, then the world is another, another thing that we struggle with too, the world system, what the world has to offer to us as uh, as citizens of this world. When you become a Christian, you automatically acquire an enemy, uh, Satan. 
and what an enemy he is, the oldest, trickiest, and most powerful enemy in the universe. And he's out to tempt you to make you sin against God, to disgrace you, to make your witness uh, to others ineffective. ineffective. So, uh, so do uh, what 1 Peter 5, 8 says, be sober, be vigilant. <laughs> I'm sorry, folks, my, t- <laughs> my tongue is toggled up tonight. Vigilant. Uh, in other words, watch out. Now, these are the dangers that we find in uh, 1 John 2, 16, where it speaks about the world. Somebody turn, who's got, does somebody have a living Bible here? Anybody got a living Bible? You do? You have a living Bible? Oh, that's the new living translation you've got. Okay, well, uh, anyway, in, uh, I, I like the, the way the living Bible puts this, but here's, uh, here's what basically uh, 1 John 2 16 speaks about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Now look at how these are defined. Craving something because it looks good. Craving something because it would make you feel good physically. Or craving something because it would make you feel like somebody special. And so this is a a way the Bible describes our enemy, the world. So we're struggling against these three forces that try to uh, overtake us and lead us into sin. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Uh, There are demonic temptations that take place also. Now, here's some temptations that we read about in Scripture. David was tempted. 1 Chronicles 21.1 speaks about when David was tempted to number the people. Do you remember that? He was tempted to number the people. It was a matter of pride for him to see how many people he was king over. And he was tempted to do that. Uh, Jesus was tempted. We find that in the Gospels where after fasting in the, in the wilderness, he was tempted by Satan. And so, uh, listen, it's no, uh, it's no sin to be tempted. Or Jesus uh, couldn't have gotten, gotten by with it. And Ananias and Sapphira, uh, they were tempted by Satan to lie about the property that they had sold and the money that they gave to the church. So we have demonic temptation But then we also have demonic oppression. Now this is the area where Christians have problems. Demonic oppression. Uh, This is where uh, the enemy can get in and hurt us materially. He can hurt us physically. Look what happened to Job. That was the devil's doings. He did all that stuff. And then here's uh, in Matthew 9.33, we have dumbness in Matthew 12.22, blindness. In 17, uh, in chapter 17, 15 through 18, epilepsy. And then he also tempts our minds, our, uh, our, our soul. That's what happened to Saul. You know, he had an evil spirit that came and vexed him. Now, this is an area where Christians need to be alert to. We can be oppressed. We can be influenced by demonic spirits. But then there's also demonic possession. And this is where I believe that the Christian, because our spirit... Uh, is inhabited by the Holy Spirit, that we are not subject to, to full-blown demonic possession, full-blown demonic possession, but rather uh, just in the oppressive sense can a, can a demon come against Christians. And so these are ways that uh, we can see the, the battle that we're up against, what we read about just now in uh, Ephesians chapter 6. That's why it's so important for Christians to recognize what's going on and to be uh, uh, careful. Now, <clears throat> I took this from uh, from C.C. Ryrie's theology book, Basic Theology, and I, there's different theories about where demons came from. Some believe they were they were the spirits of of a pre-Adamic race that lived on planet Earth. Uh, I I don't personally hold that view. But uh, my view is uh, uh, the same as Ryrie's here. They are fallen angels. And so we see in this chart, look over here, it says all angels. Let me get on the other side of this. And then there's a division among all angels. There, there are the unfallen, the elect angels. That's the two-thirds that remain loyal to God. And then there are the, those that rebelled with Satan. And I believe this is a source of demons, unclean spirits, whatever you choose to call them. They're, they're in different categories. There are some that are confined. We study about that in Luke and then also in Revelation. There are some that are temporarily confined and they're released during the tribulation period. 
There are others that are permanently confined. These were so bad, God locked them up. He put them in lockup, and He won't let them out ever until judgment. Now, the ones that we have the trouble with are these right here. Those that are loose and active. These are the ones that are spoken of in Ephesians chapter 6 where we're told to beware of those that are in, uh, uh, involved in our, in our circumstance, in our lives. Now this is something we looked at, I think, on a Wednesday night here once before. And uh, talking about how far does the kingdom of Satan extend? Well, God's kingdom is a kingdom of what? Kingdom of light. And Satan's kingdom is a kingdom of what? Evil. Darkness. Prince and, you know, he's the, the, the uh, prince of darkness, right? Well, what about that middle stuff? What about the so-called gray areas? What would be something in a gray area? Somebody got any suggestions about something in a gray area? In our activities, our attitudes or something? Hey, look, uh, Satan's activity, Satan's domain covers uh, more than just that which is absolutely black and dark. It also extends into the gray areas. You know, sometimes, so, sir? Complacency, laziness, you know, some, that's the real easy ones right there. But, uh, you know, things that say, oh, well, that's not so bad. That's, you, know, you know what I'm talking about. You know, people say, oh, well, I do this thing. That's not so bad. It's, it's a kind of a gray area. Friend, a gray area is, is part of Satan's area. <laughs> Amen. We are children of light. We're to walk in the light. And so anything that's not light is part of Satan's domain. How do we get messed up with demons? We get over in the gray and in the evil areas. You see, think of it like this. And I'm, uh, well, let's put it like this. Say there's a, there's a circle around us. Circle of hedge of protection. We talk about that. When we step outside of that hedge, where are we? We're in Satan's domain then. We step out from under that. I mean, God says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. We know that. But hey, listen, when that prodigal son uh, left home, he went to the far country. And you know what I say, the far country is a lot closer than you think it is. <laughs> the far country is just one step outside of God's will. You're still God's child, but you're in the far country. When we get one step outside of God's will, we're in the far country. Amen? Is this making sense? <laughs> yeah. So uh, let's understand that. Now, our own sinful human nature is one of the things that tempts us, and also we're tempted by a demonic temptation. And then there's that matter of oppression and then possession for those that are not in Christ. Now, that doesn't mean when a person is totally possessed that they're going to act just like that guy that we read about uh, in Mark 5 about the demoniac in Gadara. A person can be full of the devil and act just perfectly normal most of the time. But then in certain circumstances, that demon is going to flash out. Amen? You all follow me? It's not like the exorcist. Well, I remember when I saw that. I was traveling when I saw that. And that's when we were in a clothing business in Dallas. And uh, I was off somewhere down in Houston or somewhere. And I went to that movie. And, and that thing scared the liver out of me. I was a grown man. That, that movie scared me. I went back to the motel and got my Gideon out. <laughs> Found that Gideon Bible in there and started reading that thing. I said, hey, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> and I started reading those demon stuff stories in the Bible. And uh, I, w I was lost at that time. I wasn't even saved. Man, that got my attention, though, I tell you. <laughs> Here are some signs of demon activity. Uh, some uh, three identifying marks of evil spirits. They, they want to enslave. They don't have to possess you to enslave you. They want to defile you and they want to torment you. And so these are three main identifying marks of evil spirits. Now they, this is not exclusive. I mean this is not exhaustive. This isn't everything. But this is the main ways that they work. They want to enslave you. They want to get you hooked on something. They want to get you hooked on pornography. They want to get you hooked on some evil habit. They want to get you hooked on something. They want to defile you. They want to take that Christian 
And they want to bring that Christian into a place where he acts just like the rest of the world. He wants, they want to bring you down. The demon looks at you and says, you're going down. And if we're not real careful, we will go down in some way. In some way. And they want to torment you. Now, on the bottom of the page, uh, uh, here are a number of uh, different areas where in uh, man's personality, which, which comes under attack, he, uh, we come under attack in our attitudes. Our attitude, just the way we feel about stuff. Our attitudes about things. And our emotions. Boy, that's a place where Satan can really get in. In our emotions. Our passions, our angers. Uh, in the area of sex. My goodness, our, our culture is sex crazy. It is sex crazy. I mean, it's not enough to avoid watching programs on TV that are corrupting. The commercials for those programs come on. And before you know it, you've got 30 seconds of garbage dumped into your mind. Appetites and desires. Are you in control of your appetite? Are you? You know, nearly everywhere in the Bible that drunkenness is mentioned, uh, what, what's mentioned along with it? <laughs> This is a Baptist group here. They know that. <laughs> uh, unforgiveness. Well, if you, if you live in unforgiveness, guess what? Go back up there to number three. Guess where you are? You're in the hands of the tormentors. And then number six, a lack of love. How will we know? Boy, I tell you what, Sean, you've been doing a great job with those kids. And, and you know, we, we adults eavesdrop when you teach those kids. So, uh, you've been doing a great job teaching about love. Folks, listen, if we just practice what we say we believe about love, well, the enemy wouldn't have much of a place to get in, would he? Now, what I want to do tonight uh, with you for just a few minutes, and I'm not going to get heavy on this because we could spend uh, a long, long time on this, but I have taken uh, from... Uh, uh, Rick Godwin's book, uh, Exposing Witchcraft in the Church. I took out of the back of it uh, the uh, appendix that he had there that shows, and let's just I'll move it over this way. I don't know if he did this list or, or someone else, but anyway, it's in his book. But on the far left, you find the spirit. You know, Jesus, when he would deal with a spirit, he would ask for what? He wanted them to identify themselves. Because he won't know what kind of spirit he was dealing with. And so we have the spirit here on the, on the left. And then we have the fruit. What, will, what a person, the, the Bible says by their fruit, you should know. The fruit shows how, I mean, it will, uh, excuse me, it will, the fruit of that spirit will come out in these different ways. A haughty spirit will come out in pride in idleness, and I see he's got scriptures there that deal with all of these, see all these scriptures? And then to be loose, there's, there's ways to walk in the Spirit so that you'd be loose to those things. But pride, idleness, arrogance, smugness, obstinance, rebellion, scorn, strife, contentions, rejection of God. We were talking about that this morning, weren't we? You know, uh, that, that message this morning was, was aimed mainly uh, as an evangelistic message, but you know what? Those were, chill, those were God's people. That was Israel. That was God's people that rebelled against God. Oh, we don't like this sorry manna. We don't like this lousy water. I mean, it's water from the rock. <laughs> we don't like this lousy stuff. Why didn't you bring us out here in this wilderness to die? We had it so much better in slavery <laughs> back in Egypt. <laughs> You know, that, was, that wasn't lost people. That was God's people that were rebelling like that. We can, we can be just like a lost person sometimes. And uh, so these are ways that uh, that spirit of haughtiness, uh, self-righteousness, look at that. There's self-righteousness. Can I get that? Yeah. Self-deception. Self-deception. Uh, when we were over in Shreveport this last week and Jim Cimbala 
preached for about 600 pastors and staff members and their wives there in the morning session. And he was preaching about an occasion where, where Saul was chasing after David and David went to a certain city and delivered that city from their enemy and then, and then he asked the Lord, should I remain in this walled city or will, if Saul comes, they'll turn me over and give me over to Saul and God told him to get out of there. So he got out. But Saul heard that he was in this walled city where he'd be trapped. And he said, and Saul said, the God has delivered my enemies into my hand. Well, David wasn't his enemy. God hadn't done that. But Saul was so messed up. He was so messed up. He was deceived. That's kind of scary, isn't it? That's kind of scary. And a haughty spirit can bring us into a place of self Deception, self-righteousness. Now here's another spirit, heaviness. You have a problem with heaviness? Here's some ways that, that that spirit, the fruit of that spirit, the way it'll express itself. Excessive mourning, rejection, insomnia, self-pity. Boy, we get on a pity party sometimes, don't we? <laughs> self-pity. Poor me, poor me. Sorrow, grief, excessively. Taking this back up again. Brokenheartedness, despair, dejection, hopelessness, inner hurts, a torn spirit, a broken spirit, heaviness, depression, suicide. That spirit of heaviness will bring us right on into a place like that. What do you think when a Christian commits suicide? Can a real Christian commit suicide? I think so. Sure you can. Sure you can. Uh, I think that the enemy can get you, get you under a, a, the influence of a spirit like this or he can work through your, through your soulish nature to the point that a Christian, a true Christian, true believer, could get to the point that that would be, that would be what could happen. So when someone uh, you know, said, well, they must not have really been saved. They wouldn't have killed themselves. Well, you just hadn't walked in their shoes. You don't know what they were dealing with. Jealousy. Look what a spirit of jealousy can do. It can bring us to murder, hate, anger, revenge, or excuse me, rage, revenge, spite, cruelty, jealousy, dissension, competition, strife, envy, contention. A lying spirit looks strong deception, superstitions. Accusations, flattery, false prophecy, religious bondage, slander, false teachers, gossip, lie, divination, a spirit of divination. Look at all of these. Man, this looks like stuff you see advertised on TV, doesn't it? Psychic hotline. Hmm. Hmm. Divination again. Familiar spirits. Look at all this. Spiritus, medium, yoga, perverse. Look at this one, peeping and muttering. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. Um, there was, uh, matter of fact, uh, Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, was a stone peeper. Did you know that? A stone peeper. What stone peepers would do is they'd take stones and put it in their hat and they'd put their face in their hat and they'd look down into their hat and those stones and they'd be telling the future based on what those stones... That was called a stone peeper. <laughs> what people will do instead of just going to the Lord, I tell you. <laughs> a perverse spirit, wounded, uh, a wounded spirit, evil actions, foolishness, atheistic spirit. And uh, this goes on for page after page after page. And if you'd like to get a copy of this, well, uh, maybe somebody would... Uh, go into the copy machine tonight and, and run these off as long as people want them. But these are the, the spirits, the fruit of, the spirit, of those spirits, and then here are scriptures that deal with that, and then the scriptural remedy for it. So uh, there's, a, there's several of those here. We can, we can run you off some copies if you're making a file on this. <clears throat> if you feel that you have uh, the spirit of, uh, if you have the spiritual gift of, uh, of uh, discernment, you may want to familiarize yourself with this. 
So uh, that will be available to you if you want to get that. Now last week, we were going through those notes from uh, the book that I had from James Robinson. And we came to uh, Psalm 18, and then we stopped there. But uh, let's just look at this very quickly together. And Psalm 18 is a wonderful psalm that has to do with how God is our deliverer. And uh, as I was uh, looking at this earlier, I was thinking about that new song, that song that's out now, My Deliverer is Coming, My Deliverer is Drawing Nigh. I love that song. And God is our deliverer, amen? He is our deliverer. We are no match for all these spirits. We're no match for these demonic powers in our own human nature. But guess what? We don't operate in this realm in our own human power. We operate in the power of Almighty God. We've been given authority. Authority. Remember last week we talked about that policeman has a badge on, he raises his hand up, and that 18-wheeler has to stop. It's not because he's strong enough to stop that 18-wheeler with one hand. It's because he's got the authority to stop that. Some of you are saying, well, he better get his hand up early. He might not be able to stop it anyway. <laughs> but that's the, way, that's the way we operate. We operate under the authority that we have from Almighty God. In Psalm 18, it says this, I love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Here we recognize God as our strength, our rock, our vantage point, our fortress, our deliverer, our refuge, a shield, power, and source of salvation, and our stronghold. In verse 3, let's read verse 3. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from all my enemies. I'm saved from my enemies. Uh, here in verse 3, we praise Him for it is He who saves us from our enemies. And then in uh, verses 4 through 29, we won't read all that because of the time, but you may want to. Matter of fact, I would suggest that before you go to bed tonight, get this psalm and just go over Psalm 18. Just go over it and over and over, especially especially if any of the fruit that we talked about just a moment ago is something that's active in your life right now. Especially if right now you're having trouble uh, with being enslaved or in torment or uh, any of those other three areas that we talked about, being defiled. If you're in any of those, get into Psalm 18 and recognize that God is your source. He's your strength. Uh, but in that passage, James has down here that God stops at nothing to give His people victory over the enemy. Folks, listen, there's no such thing as peaceful coexistence with Satan. We want victory. God wants us to have victory. Not to just peacefully get along. Satan, now, now you just leave me alone and I leave you alone. No, it's not going to work that way because he's going to come after you. He's going to come after you. And then in verses 30 through 36, it shows how God trains and prepares His people for spiritual combat. And then verses 37 through 42, by pursuing the enemy, Christians can achieve total victory. This is good. Uh, it says, uh, matter of fact, look back up at verse 36. And my feet have not slipped. And then verse 37, I pursued my enemies and overtook them. I and I did not turn back until they were consumed. I shattered them so that they were uh, not able to rise. They fell where? Under my feet. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Under my feet. Amen. And he goes on to describe there how we should just grind. Those. Look at verse 42. Then I beat them fine as the dust before the wind and I emptied them out as the mire of the street. In other words, he stomped, he stomped those enemies flat and then he took his shoe and he shook the dust out of his shoe from the stomping of those enemies. And that's the way God wants us to have victory over these powers that come against us. Does this sound good to you? <laughs> it sounds good to me. <laughs> How about you? It sounds good to me. I mean, stomp them suckers flat. 
stomp them, stomp a mud hole in them, and then keep on stomping until you stomp it dry, and then dust your feet off. Now, that sounds real good, and, and it's, it's a little bit uh, uh, you know, in, in the realm of just uh, being a picture, but how do we do that in actuality? How do you do that in actuality? Well, you do. You just get rid of those spirits. You just stay after you drive them completely away. But here's another thing you do. You don't allow anything to be around you to give them a foothold to get back in. If you've got a problem with alcohol, you pour that stuff out. You rebuke that spirit. You get rid of that spirit. You keep pursuing it, and then you don't give him any ammunition to get back into your life. Amen? Get that junk out of your house. You know, we're good folks here. We're good Christian people, spirit-filled people. I bet you every one of us has got videos in our house our house right now. Not, not, you know, those real bad, 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 bad ones, but I bet every one of us has got some kind of video in our house right now. It doesn't belong there. It doesn't belong to Christian's house. Well, it's a good story. It's good. But it's got some bad language in it. Isn't it amazing how even in children's movies they'll slip that language in? You know that movie uh, years ago, Annie, that musical Annie? Man, that's a great, what a great story, what a great musical that is. But they got GD in there. Now how do you think God feels about you and I having stuff like that in our house? Let me ask you another question. What do you think Satan thinks about you having it in your house? Is this making any sense? Was it in Ephesus that when all those people got saved, they brought all their stuff together and they had a big bonfire? Burn up all their books of sorcery and witchcraft? And... Isn't that right? You know, we, we could probably go home and have a house cleaning tonight. <laughs> That's right. Don't put it in the garage sale. Throw it away. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm a little under conviction this myself. I, I, you know, I've got some movies that I think are good movies, but they got some little thing in there. You know. Does, does it disturb you for me to be honest about it? I mean, I'm, you know, you do too. Don't look at me like that. But if, uh, if God is merciful and all, he, but Satan, if he's looking for a foothold, you know what? Uh, maybe, maybe you can sit there and watch that movie. And it may be a perfectly good movie, except for, you know, so it's just got a little bad language in it, you know. Just a little bad language. Just one little, one little, nude, one little nude scene. One little nude scene. Okay? But guess what? Your kids see you watching that stuff. People come over to your house and they see that on your shelf. They say, well, well, he's a better Christian than I am, so if, he, if he'll do that, well, you know, kind of cuts me some slack. Doesn't it? Does any of this make sense? Now that's just in the natural. But what goes on in the supernatural? What if Satan is using that, that, that stuff as, you know, we just... Buy it, we watch it a couple times, stick it on the shelf, we don't look at it, you know, for two or three more years. Got on nine ninety five, I mean big deal, you know. <laughs> Go down to Walmart and you get those things for nine ninety five now. <laughs> but hey, wait a minute. If that's an avenue for Satan to get into your life, it's not worth having. Is it? Hmm. We jump on kids about the music. What about our movies? Amen. Oh, I better get off of this. Yeah, let's change the subject. <laughs> but we need to pursue and overtake and shatter them uh, uh, to let God uh, let God subdue them under you. Uh, and God will, uh, in uh, verse forty, God will make them turn to flee, and you destroy them. Forty one, uh, they may cry for mercy. How would how would uh, how would a demon cry for mercy to someone that's pursuing it? 
just make you cool off a little bit, you know. So, oh, it's not, this thing isn't so, so bad. It's kind of like what we've been talking about. But 42 says, finish them off. Beat them into dust. Then empty the dust out of your boots and be on your way. Folks, uh, this, is, uh, this is serious stuff we're talking about. Do you realize that? This is serious stuff that we're talking about. And, and we may, uh, you know, have a little, you know, may joke a little bit about it, smile while we're talking about this tonight. But this is serious stuff. It doesn't get any more serious than this. For us to come under the influence of demonic powers in any way. How much, how much influence do you want a demon to have over you? 50%? 40 percent? 30? 20? 10? 5%? How much influence do you want a demon to have over your life? Zero. Zero. Here's some steps to deliverance. <clears throat> First of all, be sure that you're saved. Be sure that you're saved. How can you be sure that you're saved? How can you really be sure? When I preach like I did this morning, I'm always concerned that I'm going to make some Christian that has the kind of temperament or personality where they have trouble feeling solid about anything, maybe it's over stuff. I don't want to make saved people feel lost. It's, that's one of Satan's big tricks is to make saved people feel lost. But another trick of his is to make lost people feel saved. That's worse. But I don't want to make saved people feel lost. I don't want to feel lost. Let's be honest about it. Don't you, don't, doesn't everybody sometime or another you feel lost? You know what I say when, I, when somebody says they never have doubts, I doubt it because you know, I think everybody does from time to time because Satan wants us to feel lost. So how, how can we be sure that we're saved? Say, Pastor, I don't feel saved. Well, folks, it's not the way we feel. What matters is the facts. The fact is what... The fact is what God has said. And we put our faith in what God has said. And then our feelings will line up with those things. You see what I'm saying? Jesus, remember what I said? Jesus says, I stand at the door and I knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. Our part, you open the door. Our part is to receive Him. His part is to save us, redeem us, and so forth. So we, we can know we're saved if we've done what the Bible says we must do to be saved. Right? That was a week. <laughs> right? Right. We do what the Bible says, and that's how we know we're saved. Not by the way we feel. We receive Him. We confess with our mouths Jesus is Lord. We believe in our hearts that God has raised Him from the dead. <clears throat> Number two, confess all known sin. Now these are just some suggested steps. Now friend, listen, you can't get delivered if you intend to keep on doing what you're doing. If you, if you, one of the things where I think Christians mess up so much is that we want to have a little pocket of sin over here, but we just want to keep it under control. And you know what? You can't do that. You can't do that. Sin is pernicious. Confess all known sin. Break Satan's legal rights to your life by renouncing him. Every known sin and its effect upon your life. Submit yourselves therefore unto God. Resist the devil and he shall flee from you. Here we, here we go again. Can't get away from this. Get rid of all materials which give place to the devil. Put an end to all ungodly relationships. And avoid places and circumstances which are harmful to your walk 
in the Spirit. <laughs> Dad says, son, I don't want you swimming in the creek anymore. That's dangerous. I don't want you swimming in the creek when you come home from school. He saw the boy going off to school that morning. He had his swimsuit tucked under his books. Dad said, hey, son, I thought I told you not to, not to swim in the creek anymore. He said, well, Dad, I'll just take it out along in case I got tempted. <laughs> a cute little story, but I tell you what, we, make place, we give place to the devil, don't we? Number five, command the demons to go in the name of Jesus. Number six, make a fresh start with God by faith claiming the filling of the Holy Spirit. Remember that testimony we listened to, James Robinson? Last week, remember that? He got delivered. Then his, his friends laughed at him about it. He let it go. And what happened? He said that that demon came back and brought seven more. And he, was, he went from being in the fire into being the, in the furnace. And then number seven, prioritize your life. Seek you first the kingdom of God. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You say, well, I'm too good a Christian to let a demon get in possession of my life or get in control of my life. Folks, it can happen to anyone. It can happen to any one of us. All we've got, as a matter of fact, I believe this. I believe that the longer you are with the Lord and the more you know, the less of an opening Satan needs to get into your life. If you'll allow it, he just needs a little crack to get in. Does that make sense? To those that have been given much, much is required. And when we've walked with the Lord a long time and we have, uh, we have a lot of knowledge and we give in, it doesn't take much to give Satan a, a, an entrance into our life. He can get in on anybody. 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 That means he can get in on you. That means he can get in on me. I don't want Satan to have any control over me. I don't want him to have any. And by the grace of God, I want to chink up all the cracks. <laughs> Amen. I want to give him a place to get back. Amen. Praise God. Now let's stand. And uh, Joey, would you come uh, and play on the keyboard tonight? And we'll just have a time. Uh, and I want to get our prayer team down here you guys would come on down and uh, there may be some folks here that would like to have a prayer partner in going through some of these steps and uh, if, if you would like to have someone to pray with you about being delivered tonight uh, we, we, we'd be glad to, to help you with this you, you really don't need anybody you can, deliver, you can be delivered on your own because you have the authority that, that everybody else has too we have the authority. We have you got your badge, and you can you can do it for yourself. 